our, our first piece, um, How Can I Keep From Singing, which is my favorite hymn because it just embodies. Embod oh, here, I'm going to choke up. Embodies everything that I live for. Music will take you over any kind of obstacle that you have in your life, and that's happened to me so many times. And um, this piece was arranged with, um, you'll see they have the dowels. Some of you have seen this before. It's called a singing bell, and this is a very ancient Himalayan custom. Uh, it, I think it originated in the monasteries of the Himalayas and it produces a sound that is just unlike anything else I think it just gives me goosebumps every time I hear it um, our next one uh, is uh, with a piano joyful joyful you all know what that is and our piece during the service we have our resident violinist joining us for that piece it's um, it's a Brazilian uh, praise prayer Beautiful, beautiful melody, and uh, Gail has agreed to to accompany us with that. So I'm really looking forward to that too.
Well, good morning. Good morning. And Bells, thank you so much. That was absolutely beautiful. And uh, going on behind the scenes many times, you don't understand all the things that go into ringing these bells. They're not easy. So congratulations to all of our bell ringers there. It was beautiful, just beautiful. I know a lot of you are waiting to hear about last night's amazing turkey dinner. So before we do any more about the announcements, I'm going to say, Dan, come on down. Good morning, everyone. Well, for those who uh, came out la yesterday and enjoyed a, a wonderful turkey dinner uh, from everyone who was there that I heard from anyways, they all said it was uh, very, very good. <clears throat> so first of all, I want to thank to uh, all the volunteers who help out either in uh, preparing some of the food or in uh, bacon, buying the pies. Um, and uh, also those that uh, did come out and enjoy. It's uh, very appreciative to see the numbers out there and uh, to see everyone helping out. <clears throat> I want to give some special thanks to uh, Carol Seifrey and her husband Doug. They're the ones who go get the uh, big 50-pound uh, bag of potatoes and uh, carrots, so uh, without them picking them up for us, uh, that would be the majority of the meal gone. And then also to my wife, Alice, uh, she's the one who gets me moving and uh, starting to prepare all the uh, organization for this ahead of time, and she's the one who does all the wonderful decorations on the tables. <laughs> so the numbers everyone's been waiting for, we sold 130 tickets. We served, by my count anyways, 123 plus, uh, either there or in takeouts, uh, including my wife and I who took a takeout because we never seemed to eat until afterwards anyways. So from the dinner alone, we raised $2,115. This, I'll have to give credit to those in attendance because from the raffle we raised another $570. So for anyone who's done the math quickly, that comes out to $2,685 to the church. So again, thank you very much for those who uh, helped out and uh, attended. See you in March for the corned beef dinner. Which means we mark it on our calendar now. Sometime in March, we have corned beef dinner. Sometime in next November, turkey dinner again. Yes. Yummy. Well, a lot of announcements, and please take a moment to read them. Thank you so much for helping out with the handicap parking in the mornings on Sundays and not parking there unless you have the handicap sticker. It really does make a huge difference. A reminder, we have the... Um, Unbroken video coming up November 9th at 3 o'clock in the Dresser Friendship Room. And that's building up to Remembrance Day, which we will be honoring next Sunday. Also, for those that might be interested, we do have the information regarding our PAR envelopes. So if you are interested, please take a moment, read what that's all about. And it certainly does say that Sunday morning when you go searching for the envelopes and try to remember what you need to do. Also, now that turkey's over, we have our bazaar coming up, our book sale, Christmas bazaar, and bake sale. So you now are marking on your calendars November 23rd from 9 till 2, right here. And we look forward to seeing a lot of you there. And thank you ahead of time. We've had a number of things coming in for the bazaar and book sale, and we really appreciate that. So thank you very much. And let's uh, take a moment now to quiet our hearts and our minds as we get ready for our service.
Good morning, everyone. And uh, welcome to our worship service this morning. It's a great day to be alive, isn't it? Beautiful, sunny day. Another day on this side of the grass. It's a great day for uh, bad people to become good, for good people to become better, right? <laughs> It's a great day for us to recognize the fact that we are all on spiritual journeys of transformation, perhaps, of learning, learning to love, becoming better and better disciples. Right? Certainly it's a journey of change. So welcome to the sanctuary where we celebrate that change. Will you join me now in a responsive call to worship? For those of you who may be new to the church, you're invited to read the text printed in red. We begin. We have gathered today in search of transformation. We stand fearless at the edge of change. Be still. Be still and know that God is God. Let us pray. Holy God, you have commanded us not to be afraid and have assured us of your presence. In the midst of trials and joys, sorrows and dreams, may we know your presence and rejoice. Grant us courage, O oh God, to take delight in your spirit at all times and in all places. Grant us faith, O oh God, to see the myriad ways you give life. Grant us hope, O oh God, to participate in your work in the world. Grant us love, O oh God, to welcome Respond and act with compassion in all that we say and do. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Let's join now in a simple chorus. I think you all know this one. Come into his presence. Please be seated. Margaret Makoda will now lead us in a responsive psalm, number 149. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let them praise God's name with dancing. Let them sing God's praise with tambourine and harp. 
For you, O God, take delight in your people. Let the faithful exult in their glory. Let God's praise be on their lips. To bring the nations to justice. To bind their rulers with fetters. To execute on them the sentence decreed. This is the glory of all our saints.
At this time, I'd like to invite all the little members of the church to come forward. Hi there. How's it going, guys? Did you like the bells and the violin? Oh. You know, Gail and Margita never really want us to clap after after they play, but my gosh, it's hard to resist, isn't it? Hey, did you bring cookies? Where's my cookie? <laughs> you want to sit down, Isla? You want to sit over here? Sure, why don't you sit here? Oh, good place to eat your cookie. Guys, uh, just bear with me for a second. I need you to put on your imaginary hats. Or no, rather your imagination hats. I want you to pretend that this is a live plant. Right? It's a real live growing plant. We know it's not, but got to pretend. What does this plant need to grow? Water. <laughs> Water. That's right to that. I wanted to get right to that point. I thought we were going to go through sunshine and energy and water and sun. sun. Yep. But this morning I want to talk about water. Now there's not much water in this plant. In fact, there's no soil in this plant. <laughs> Arlene, what kind of plants are these? <laughs> Ones that always grow. <laughs> hey? Water. Did you know that we all need water? We all need water to live, don't we? Yeah. Did you know that half of our bodies are water? Yes. Did you know that? Yes, There's not much I can tell you that's new this morning, is there? Okay. Well, listen, I want to tell you a story about how important water is but how difficult it is sometimes for people to get their water. I want to tell you the story about Marcel, who lives in Africa. Does everybody know where Africa is? It's far, far away, isn't it? Eh? It's way on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. Oh, that's far. But listen to this. There once was a boy named Marcel who lived in Africa. He was eight years old. Okay? And like all the other children in the village, he had to go down to the river several times a day to get the water his mom and dad needed for the family. It was his job. And he would have to go down several times a day because they needed the water for drinking, they needed the water for bathing, 
right? For washing up the dishes, all kinds of things like we need water for, right? I feel like you shouldn't bring the water to bathe. I feel like you should just go to the river. <laughs> Run with me on this, my friend. Run with me on this. You're absolutely right. Why not go down there to bathe? Exactly. Instead of carting all the water up. But what happens if that a little child like Isla? Maybe they can't make it down to the river. Maybe the river's full of crocodiles. Then you wait for it to rain, go outside in underwear and get a bar of soap and You do not go around the village in your underwear. I don't care where the village is. No, we have a disagreement on that one. In your backyard, eh? Okay, maybe in the backyard. I'll go with that. If there's a fence. Huh? If there's, if there's a fence, but you can see through fences, right? But now Landon's telling me we want to get back on track. Okay, so, there's lots of water in the river, but Marcel has to go every day to get these, this, uh, these buckets of water. Okay, now, do you think that he would be the type of guy to waste water. <laughs> no way. Not after carting. Oh, thank you for joining us. How you doing? <laughs> Were you having a nap downstairs? You found the couch, didn't you? <laughs> Where was I? Oh yeah, wasting water. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Wasting water. Marcel, there's no way he wasted a drop, I'm sure. Because he had to cart it up from the river. But do you think we waste water here in Canada? How do we waste water? What kinds of ways do we waste water? Well, when you have a bath, you waste it. When you spill a cup of glass, or when you're hot after playing at the park, you take a cold water bottle. Yeah, pour it on your head. What about when you're uh, maybe washing vegetables? It's good to wash them, but sometimes we just let the water go on and on and on and on. Maybe we, we walk to the other side of the kitchen to cut the vegetables, forget to turn the tap off, right? Or we take super long showers, sort of like what you're saying with the bath. No, I'm looking at water stuff for that one. Okay. Oh, does somebody waste water in the shower here? <laughs> That's payback for not picking my number last night on the raffle. Really? I feel like all girls waste water. All girls waste water. Did you hear that, girls? All girls waste water. They're too worried about the other guys and having to scared. What can we say? No. Amen. <laughs> hey? Lots of ways we waste water, right? Lots of ways. Okay, what else have I got here? Meanwhile, this is most important. Don't we sometimes waste water when we pollute the water? What do I mean by pollute the water? Throwing garbage in the water. Yes, throwing garbage in the water, right? What about chemicals? Like paint or any of that stuff? Throwing it in the water. Eggs. Eggs? You don't like eggs? You don't like eggs, eh? What about spaghetti? Do you like spaghetti? Okay, so we can have the spaghetti in the water. What else? How else do we pollute the water? By uh, not taking care of it. By not taking care of it. You're absolutely right. And that's so important, isn't it, that we take care of our water and take care of our air, take care of our planet, right? A lot of the times, water that we drink from the tap, it's not natural water, it's contaminated with chemicals. Like, it's water, but it's like, not the natural... Not pure, pure, natural water. You're right, because they add chemicals at the water plant, right? Yeah. To make sure that it is safe. But we have some of the safest water in the world. Do you know that Susan called the city when we first moved into, the, uh, into our house just to have the water tested? Just to make sure that it was good, and ours came back absolutely, like, almost perfect. So Windsor water is very good, not to worry. Very, very, very good water. But anyways, all this to tell you it's bad to waste, right? Wasting water, could be wasting other things, wasting food, all things that we take for granted, right? Killing animals. Killing animals unnecessarily, right? Isn't that wasting? 
Yes, when you throw garbage in the, in the rivers and the lakes, the fish get stuck. I don't know if a lot of people know this, but my grandma lives on Riverside, and there was this one night I was staying the night with her, and there were thousands of dead fish on, like, on the edge. Of on the edge of the shore. Yeah, thousands. Oh, thousands of dead fish. I actually got a key, got two of them, and I put them in a water tank. Really, eh? Well, you know, that's so important eh, to keep this in mind. We don't want to wreck the place. Yeah? Your mom and dad say that again? They're sitting far away? They're, no, 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 they're pretty close. I can see them. They're planning to sleep during the sermon? What? <laughs> oh, their vacation is far, far away. They don't need a vacation. They sleep most Sundays. <laughs> okay, are we? I, I got a new prayer for you guys today. You want to hear this prayer? Okay, let's bow our heads. This is a good one. Creator God, we thank you for the gift of life-giving water. Help us to remember that not only people, but also plants and animals need water to stay healthy. Help us to change our ways so that good, clean, healthy water is available for every living thing in your world. How's that for prayer? You think we can remember to do that, take care of the water? Hey, eh? I think it's a good idea. So why don't we say together, Amen. Amen. Okay, have fun in Sunday school, guys. What, Landon, is this yours? Did you drop that? Okay. You See you later, brother. Okay, don't lose it. <laughs> what was she saying, Bree? Get a move on, get a move on? <laughs> In uh, many and various ways, God gives us comfort and hope. Comfort and hope. Even the hope of eternal life. In gratitude then, let us give generously. Our morning offering will now be received, and as it is being collected, we're going to sing a new hymn. This is number 699 in your red hymn books. The lyrics will also be up on the screen. It's called Live Into Hope. And again, for those of you who may be new, we'll sing the first three verses seated, and the fourth verse will stand. 699. <laughs>
Let us pray. Holy One, in gratitude for all that you give us, including those who have gone before us, we offer you these gifts and ask you to bless and multiply them, that they may become the good work and word that comforts and strengthens both our hearts and the hearts of others. Amen. Please be seated. Set the bell ringers. <laughs> the psalmist tells us that the Lord is near to all who call upon God in truth. Therefore, let us now turn to God in prayer trusting in the nearness and the compassion of the Holy One. 
Together in unison, let us pray our prayer of confession. Together. Holy God, we come before you a broken people in a broken world. We confess we have ignored yet again your assured presence. We have forged our own paths and charted our own waters. In the name of independence, we have ignored your aid, your comfort, and your peace. We have called upon you in desperation, rather than recalling your mighty and faithful acts in all times and places. Forgive us. You have been with us in exile and liberation. Be with us even now, we pray. Amen. Be assured that in Christ Jesus, we are all, each one of us, forgiven. Praise the Lord and bless God's holy name. I would like to now read a portion of Paul's second letter to the church in Thessalonica. In it, he urges people not to be so preoccupied with the coming day of the Lord as with doing and saying good as the whole world waits. I hope you're all as excited as Isla to hear this reading. <laughs> Can't wait. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together with him, I beg you, my friends, not to be so easily confused in your thinking or upset by the claim that the day of the Lord has come. Perhaps it is thought that we said this while prophesying or preaching or that we wrote it in a letter. Do not let anyone deceive you in any way. For the day will not come until the final rebellion takes place and the wicked one appears who is destined to hell. He will oppose every so-called God or object to worship and will put himself above them all. He will even go in and sit down in God's temple and claim to be God. Don't you remember? I told you all this while I was with you. We must thank God at all times for you, friends, you whom the Lord loves. For God chose you as the first to be saved by the Spirit's power to make you his holy people and by your faith in the truth. God called you to this through the good news we preach to you. He called you to possess your share of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, our friends, stand firm and hold on to these truths which we taught you both in our preaching and in our letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and is in his grace, gave us unfailing courage and a firm hope, encourage you and strengthen you to always do and say what is good. <coughs> a minister new to Boston, Massachusetts. He asked his congregation to name the single hardest time they had suffered as a church. The single hardest time. Since Boston is a port city, he expected them to talk about all the changes that had swept over the church as various immigrant groups arrived and changed the nature of their city. Or, he thought perhaps people would refer back to their early history and talk about their experiences during the American Revolutionary War. As the minister later learned, 
The British had burned the church in 1774 and had shot and killed the minister's wife. Don't worry, Sue, I'm with you. <laughs> but alas, none of these possibilities top the list. The congregation said that their hardest time came in 1843 when the pastor of the day persuaded members of the congregation to give away their homes and farms to don long white robes and to wait on a hilltop for Jesus. Many people did. And they waited a long time. Finally, after many hours, they went home and shamefaced asked for their property to be returned. Now, we may laugh at their naivete, but there's something about the idea that God will step in somehow to end the world that continues to intrigue us to this day. Just consider how popular the Left Behind series of books were and the resulting movie that was made. You see, today, folks see signs of the coming apocalypse in global warming, perhaps in the hellfire of the Middle East, Earlier generations found it in the Soviet Empire or the bubonic plague of medieval times. In Jesus and Paul's day, the people found signs of the apocalypse in the brutality of the Roman Empire. In other words, for every generation, it seems, there are signs of the end times that are not hard to spot if you're determined to find them. Now Paul, in that portion of the letter that I read to you, stressed the nearness of the day of the Lord. A day when the righteous would be judged worthy and gathered up to meet the Lord in his coming again. Right? Paul stressed the uh, the nearness of that day and the nearness of his people's salvation from Rome. In fact, he thought that the day was right around the corner. He stressed that nearness in order to keep the people's hope alive. These were desperate times. Given the the hardship and the persecution that they were facing. Still, for Paul, the day was only near. It had not yet arrived as others were preaching. Now, we could spend hours, days, I bet you even years, trying to decipher the precise events described in Paul's letter. We could try to figure out precisely the identity of the wicked one. Right? And the nature of the cosmic and the apocalyptic struggle yet to come. We could try to think of verses and then link these verses somehow, these verses in the passage, with certain contemporary events. Eh? We could do that. So as to predict the date of that struggle and the final end. You've heard of people doing that, haven't you? And then, huh, we could all sell our homes. Eh? We could put on some long white robes. Go sit on a hillside somewhere. If there is one in Essex County, I don't know. But in any event, we could just sit there and wait for Jesus, couldn't we?
But maybe I really shouldn't joke about this, should I? For I wouldn't want to downplay in any way the theological significance of the cosmic forces to which Paul alludes in his text. One of my favorite authors, a gentleman by the name of Walter Wink, he argues that because most Christians today no longer believe in actual creatures like Satan or the wicked one, we tend to dismiss them as unimportant. And yet these creatures remind us that catastrophe and evil are very real. Even if we no longer perhaps personify them. Are you with me? People in the time of Jesus and Paul, they took a host of principalities and powers to be quite real. Wink writes, and I quote, what the ancients called spirits or angels or demons were actual entities, but they didn't hover in the air. They were incarnate as God was incarnate in Jesus. They were incarnate in cellulose or cement or skin and bone or an empire or its mercenary armies. Wink suggests that today we might reinterpret these biblical spirits as inhabiting institutions nation-states, regimes, economic systems, any and all other entities that exert power over our lives. If this is true, then we might reinterpret the wicked one as being a spirit of extreme arrogance embodied in anyone or anything that claims to be godlike but really is anti God. Anyone or anything that prevents us from coming into the near presence of God. Sunday morning hockey comes to mind. But let's get back to thinking about the end times and about God stepping in to end the world. What's the appeal, I wonder? Surely it varies. I think for some, I know, in fact, this to be true. It's a matter of somehow one-upmanship that comes from knowing things that others don't. I've met people that fall into that category. For others, the idea that the world will end and that they will be among those who are saved is a wonderful escape from a difficult situation. I've known people like that too. It may be bad down here, but just wait, just wait. I'm gonna don my long white robe and I'm gonna walk the golden streets. But whatever draws us somehow to think about the end of the world, the day of the Lord, the second coming of Christ, whatever you want to call it. The theme is consistent throughout the Bible. 
You'll find it throughout. The Old Testament prophets, they looked forward to that day. Thousand years before Christ. Jesus saw his own ministry as leading toward that day. And his followers? Well, they eagerly awaited his return, didn't they? Everyone is waiting for the time of payback. Right? When God finally decides to rise up, he says, enough, enough already. And punishes the wicked. We're all waiting for it. And I pray that someday that will happen. I do. I pray that evil eventually will lose its power in the world. I pray for the day when sin and injustice, sickness and despair, even death itself, will finally end. It's the most vital promise to which I cling, personally. But here's the question. What is the right way to live for that tomorrow? I want you to ponder that. Do you don your long white robe and sit on a hill to wait somewhere? Is that what you do? Apparently that was the thinking of the early church in Thessalonica as well as those Bostonians. Folks were so sure that the big event was just around the corner that they quit working and moved into full-time waiting. And there are people today, I can tell you, that think the same way. Yet Paul has to tell them they're in for a long wait. And what we need to know ourselves in the 21st century, we're 2,000 years after, is that even Jesus himself didn't know when the day of the Lord will come. So how are we going to guess it? So rather than speculate about the who and the when of Christ's return, to me we ought to do what we must in the interim, and that is tend to our own souls. Rather than try to identify the wicked one, I think we need to recognize our own tendency to play that role. We can also commit to live in a way that thwarts the wicked one's next move, can't we? We can work for justice and for peace in the world, can't we? Even during times of discouragement. We can seek out and try to neutralize the evil powers that can, can inhabit institutions and nation states, regimes, armies, economic systems, anything else that can have a negative influence over our lives. Wicked powers that pretend to be godlike, but in fact stand against God. We can do that. Because the promise is, and it was a promise, that evil one day will be defeated. Evil will not rule the world one day. And for me, as I, as I hope for you, 
That promise is at once comforting, hopeful, and challenging. Because too often when we do work, when we do decide to work for justice and peace, we can become quickly discouraged. And there are times, I know, and you know too, when evil seems to hold too much power. But if we can hang on to the promise that evil's power is limited, that evil will not have the final say, then we can continue the struggle. We can do that. Knowing that God's favor will fall on those who do feed the hungry, right? Who visit the sick and the imprisoned, clothe the naked. That can sustain us in the hard times if we let it. The story is... Uh, is told that one day back in early Puritan New England, there was a major eclipse. The sun was blotted out. The day turned dark, dark, dark. People were terrified. The world is going to end. What shall we do? The people cried out. One insightful man replied, Why, let us be found going about our duty. Let us pray. Almighty God, knower of everything and everyone, help us to think not of the end time as much as the now time the time we have on this earth to serve you by serving the needs of others. To which the people replied, Amen. As you remain seated, can we sing hymn number 672, Take Time to Be Holy. 672. <laughs>
This morning I'd like to do something just a little different with our uh, prayer of the people. I'd like to offer a short reflection on the Lord's Prayer. The prayer begins, of course, our Father. We call you Father and Mother. For we can find no more suitable words to describe all that you are to us and all that you do for us. You bring us to life. You feed us, protect us, teach us, guide and direct us. You comfort us when we fail or when life fails us. You provoke us into action. You make us to lie down in green pastures when we need to rest. Our Father who art in heaven. We think of you as being in this faraway place, heaven, and at the same time wonder where heaven is. We know that you're all around us and in us, just as the wind gets into every small crack in the winter, your presence is with us. Hallowed be thy name, Father and Mother in heaven. Your name is holy to us. We want to keep it special and not use it in any offhand or profane way. You are sacred to us, unlike anyone or anything else. Thy kingdom come. Your kingdom is present whenever we grasp, even barely, the message of your love and begin to live that love in our own lives and in the world. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because when your will, your will of love, is done, there can be no more fighting, no abuse of power, no control, only living in right relationship with you and with all creation. Having in view your realm, we pray in silence or aloud for our friends and neighbors. In this community of Riverside and in all our gathered faith communities, Give us this day our daily bread. We need bread for our tables, and we want to be able to put that bread on all the tables of the world with the money we offer week to week. Bread comes as good food and safe drinking water, as it also comes with health and welfare. So we pray also for any and all who today lack what they need for a happy and healthy life. For those afflicted with disease and for those who are intervening. For those who are forced to endure natural disaster. For those who suffer the bombs and the bloodshed every day in Syria. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Help us, God, to forgive always those who would hurt us, since that is a very hard thing to do. And lead us not into temptation, 
the ones we face every day. The temptation to rush around, to overschedule, to double book, to multitask, to love that which we ought not to. But deliver us from evil. For we want all that we do and say to proclaim that in our lives, O oh God, you have the ultimate power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The final hymn of our service is one of my favorites. It expresses so clearly to me that which we ought to dedicate our lives to. It's found in the More Voices hymn book, which we do not have enough copies of, of course. But the lyrics, by some miracle, will appear up on the screen. Draw the circle wide. to the world in peace, bearing witness to God's presence. Bless God's holy name forever and ever. And hold fast to the traditions that you have been taught, giving thanks in all things. And may the Lord our God who loves us and through whom his grace gives us eternal comfort and good hope, comfort your hearts and strengthen them in every good work and word this day, and forevermore. God bless. Amen.